Hello, welcome everyone. I'm John Smalley, librarian with the Public Library here, Humanities Department on third floor. Yay! And thank you for coming to the latest uh, installation of the Poem Jam, in the latest installment. Uh, I want to take a moment to acknowledge our community. So on behalf of the Public Library, we wish to welcome you to the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards and in accordance with their traditions, the Ramatush have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as caretakers of this place. As guests, we who reside and work on their traditional territory recognize that we benefit from living and working on their homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramatush community, and by affirming their sovereign rights as First Peoples. Uh, probably most of you know that this is a regularly uh, recurring program. It's a monthly program, the second Thursday of each month, and I uh, hope you will come next month in June, where we will be featuring writers from the Multicultural Lesbian Literary Journal, uh, Sinister Wisdom. And I see some folks with that journal in the audience. That will be a good one. Um, if you want to learn more about programs, we have flyers and also the library's newsletters on the table to your right. There's also coffee and cookies, also a limited edition of the Poem Jam pin. Lovely, we have a few more of those on the table. Or you can always visit our website, sfpl.org, and look at the events calendar there. So that's all I have to say. Uh, I'm going to turn the microphone over to our host and the um, one who runs the Poem Jam series, Kim Shuck. Give a warm welcome to Kim. It's always fun reading with friends. <laughs> um, Tonight's kind of exciting for a lot of reasons. I, I'm always excited about the poets. I don't invite people whose work I don't like, but um, it's always nice when the, the balance of people are also friends, and uh, I'm pretty excited. And in a way, this is a little celebration of the one person I don't really know very well in this crew, um, Brenda, who... Um, just had a brain fart. It's been happening a lot lately. I'm losing my memory for names. It's terrible. I could quote you, but I, for a moment, I had a brain fart. Uh, who is the brand new poet laureate of Lake County? And I'm so excited to have her down here to read for us. So without further ado, Brenda Yeager. Yeah. I don't do tables, so I'm going to have to master this thing right here. How am I doing? Great. Yeah, OK. I got some tips from a friend that there, you got to work it, so I'm going to work it. Um, thank you, Kim, so much, and to the library for supporting and hosting poetry. It's such a beautiful um, through line in the heart of our culture to hear each other and to um, let human truth um, come to the forefront of our culture. So thank you, Kim. You rock. And I'm so um, touched to be in this beautiful lineup of these luminous voices. So you have a treat ahead of you. <laughs> and I'll kick us off. The first poem um, I want to read is um, seated in Lake County itself and its history. Uh, Georgina Marie Guardado, who will be reading um, tonight, was the Poet Laureate of Lake County for um, from 2020 to 2024, before me. And she held a poetry contest um, at the Kelseyville Pear Festival. And that's held in the streets of Kelseyville um, and she chose this poem as the first place winner, being Georgina, as she is. Um, and this is entitled Piriform. Piriform means pear-shaped. This is the shape of the poem. Right on. 
piriform. Earth, black and red, speaking in curves, in juice. The fruit of history hangs heavy on the branch. Who walked here, hid beneath the surface, a single reed breathing her story into our memory as her people seeped crimson into the lake. Who cleared and sowed these acres into longing, seed for the sun, skin for its gold, ancestors for their own bones, their lines spreading across corridors of land as the shadows of pear trees, fruiting sweet joy, warm and round in the palm, then dripping to the elbow. And who will speak a new name here? The sandpaper moment of its flesh on the tongue, the bitter seed for Nika and her own. There is a, a plaque. <laughs> this is a, um, an afterword to this poem for the context of it. There's a plaque in northeastern Lake County, California, marking the California Historical Landmark number 427, Bloody Island, Nopoti. One-fourth west of this plaque is the island called Bonopoti, Old Island, now Bloody Island. It was a place for native gatherings until May 15, 1850. On that date, a regiment of the first dragoons of the US Cavalry massacred nearly the entire native population of the island. Most were women and children. This act was in reprisal for the killing of Andrew Kelsey, who had long enslaved, brutalized, and starved indigenous people in the area. The island, now a hill surrounded by reclaimed land, remains a sacred testament to this sacrifice of innocence. And a note, one of the few survivors was a six-year-old girl named Nika, later known as Lucy Moore, who hid in the bloodied water and survived by breathing air through a reed. The town of Kelseyville is named after Andrew Kelsey, whose brutality is at the heart of this massacre. And so this was my response to the Kelseyville Pear Festival was the poem you just heard that Georgina chose. <laughs> um, I wanted to read that here because there's a movement right now to rename Kelseyville. Um, I will put a link to that on my website. Anyone who um, wants to go in and sign the petition and support that movement, um, the seven tribes, um, elders from the seven tribes around the lake have all met and um, decided that the name Kanakdai is the name that they would like um, to rename Kelseyville. So yeah, I wanted to bring this here to everyone's attention. This poem um, is after Muriel Urukezer. Her poem um, is untitled, but the first line of it was, I lived in the first centuries of world wars. This is crossing the border with Muriel Ruqueza. I live in the second century of world wars. Most mornings there is nowhere to go. Ringtone of the sunrise announces the day's alliances. Camps shift right side of the brain, ding. Left side of the brain, ding. Left side, right side, again, ding, ding, ding. Refugees from our own bodies. We watch refugees try to stumble away from their orange and ill-lit sky. 
I call my friends. They see it too. The stars have scattered. Once our guides, the water bearer and the scorpion distort. Unnatural lines of communication march up the night. Only the moon, crooked in her sovereignty, hangs, breathing light. Slowly, I understand. If I can steep sweet jasmine tea while another needs a pillow for her child's head, we have already reached the limits of our divided selves. This is how I live in the second century of world wars. I cross the border of my separate self to seek a pillow for her child's head. Each finds the other. Thank you. It's so fun to be in San Francisco. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so um, this next one um, is something, a longer piece I'm working on um, about family legacy. And this portion is my great-grandmother um, in the 19th century, left by her husband and alone with three boys. Virginia Helen, Legacy, Virginia, one, Virginia, Virginia Helen. Unexpected, her stance, legs like that, spread with skirts, but unknown in the gaze of men, in the time of her feet, wide and hard as the betrayal that made this moment so unruly, her standing like that. The porch barren of shelter, the land dry as wood, a tumbling on it. A house without shelter, the porch with her wide, with her skirts, with a rifle instead of a husband, held close and cocked. A house without shelter, not a home. Only her boys are the home. These three, behind her woolen, her boiled, her arid blue stance, wide enough to make a shelter out here beyond betrayal. Dust first and shadow, hooves tethered to this staccato task to serve their master's pleasure, not their own, sour oats, Soil smoke in their gait. The men mounted. Silhouettes suck their purpose from the sun. Her finger squints the trigger as their long dark casts nearer, almost touches the first step of the porch. The heat snorts without breath. Horses. Men riding boys, a lizard on a red rock, and she, everyone, blinks. They will not take this. They will not. Boys behind her boiled blue steal her spine, steady the steel in her. Hands taut only to stroke, to soothe, to Brahms, to Demir, to Pure, to Handkerchief, hands that have now rawed, chopped, clamored, hauled, struck, and stirred, hands that pulled the ring that bound her heart into a home from her own finger. Now this shotgun in her hands, unexpected, and this wide stance, Silhouette shadows stop short of her aim. How far she casts her own steel into the wide sun. They snort and heat and ma'am. Jawline authority. They are tight with their claims. Stolen from the blood 
of others, ownership of even what flows from grace, the water. They will not take this. Thank you. Um, Central Park, New York City. <laughs> this one's new. I just wrote it this morning. We'll see. You guys can tell me what it is. <laughs> um, title for now. Ice cream, ice cream was jingling outside the park as green grew a fourth leaf. Take this, the sun stretched out its fingers, tossed a field off their tips, running through my toes, cool with this casual magic, until suddenly the yes stops me. There, between my feet, green light expressing luck in quarter time, sunshine gave me a four-leafed clover. You're going to need it for later, kid. And I did. Once, for the shudder and sway of sound around us, the man loomed as if from folklore. My sister and I, all our limbs at the edge of grass near the wrought bench. Once, as that reverberation swallowed us whole, what we saw, the willow weeping out of the unzipped fly of the stranger. Once, as we hoped, we could run fast enough. And the fourth one, spent like a birthday candle, as we were dragged across midday lanes of traffic back to the scene, our father and his bat of disdain. Please, please don't let us find him. I begged that luckiest leaf, a child's prayer. Oh, father, terrible hero. I bend to this child sleeping in my own arms and find you. This is no bedtime story. As the flame of my own disdain flares to imagine any harm coming here. It's warmth, a circle in the dark heart of the tale. Um, I'm headed to see my aunt, who's in the last days of her life. And um, this was in response last week to receiving that phone call. Marble House. I read that from space, the earth is a terrible homesickness. The infinite possibilities, all those beings, and the conjunctions required for your own one impossible life held between forefinger and thumb. A marble house rolling away on the tide of days, rising, setting, rising, but always in darkness. I expected mystery. I expected wonder. Then today, I moved out into the red dirt of the yard, leaned against the old oak, who has been shocking the sky lately with its green. I placed my hands on that bark, bent over from the weight of the phone call, and wept. In that clay, the longing of my clay for her clay as her own life sets loose from its gravity. Homesickness is also the body of everyone I've ever loved in this fragile and dying world.
and I'll end with this one. Um, this was my, my New Year's poem for a brighter future. We'll see, well, <laughs> it's a bit heavy, but <laughs> in the beginning, we'll get there. All right. Like that. Like that time I came upon a wild rabbit, ears twitching a strange geometry across the axis of road, trajectory of her lost life and its uneaten berries, their plump skins would remain unbroken all spring, seeds unscattered, the tall grasses unparted by her. All the sheltered places she was going undiscovered unforgettable warmth of her body as I carried her, not quite alive, just a faint rhythm into the loam sweet irony of the roadside. Silence came for her, the only sound my luckier pulse and the dead stars still being light even after all this time. Perhaps she was male. I don't know why she felt female in my arms. Maybe her condition made the interpretation. Abandoned, bloodied in the middle of the road. The news today reminded me like that. How I want prayer to be as simple as a recipe. Warm the dark chamber to exact body temperature. Fold your tender intention into that heated heart. Watch something unbloodied rise from this new year, some barefoot way, just like that. Thank you so much. <laughs> One more round of applause, please. Brenda Yeager. Oh my God, that was an incredible set. Thank you so much. Um, our next reader is Georgina Marie. And um, it's a funny thing that happens if you're native. <laughs> you get to meet most of the other native poets because they make you read together in <laughs> November over and over and over and over. So it's really good when you like each other, because <laughs> you're going to see each other. Um, and uh, I don't actually. I think we probably met first on Zooms, more than one Zoom. I think we read together for several Zooms <laughs> during the lockdown. Um, I am in such awe of this woman's activism and um, heart that I just can't even, um, among other things, she got a... Um, <clears throat> Um, Academy of American Poets National Poet Laureate Ship Fellowship thing. I forget what they call it. Now here's the, here's the worst part about that. I am losing my memory and that's real. I mean, it's not funny. It's actually real. <clears throat> but um, I also got one of these and I still can't remember what they're called. <laughs> so it's, it's really nothing personal at all. But uh, please welcome Georgina Marie up to the microphone. I like to hide behind podiums, so I'm going to choose this spot, <laughs> if that's OK. Uh, thank you, Kim, for having me and to the library for hosting us. Um, this month, among other things, is Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Peoples Month, so I just wanted to honor that, and um, hence my red lipstick, the color of the movement. So I'm going to start off with a poem called My Mother as Dear, and it has an epigraph. Native American boarding schools were established by the US government as an effort to assimilate indigenous youth into mainstream American culture through education. This era was part of the United States overall attempt to kill, annihilate, or assimilate indigenous peoples and eradicate indigenous culture. 
There is little documented history of adult natives also institutionalized in the 1960s and 70s or their treatment inhumane or other. My mother as deer. Deer see headlights, they freeze. I asked God if my mother saw the institution coming, if God had the power to prevent it. My mother's mother moving through any blinding spotlight to reach a cage for her daughter, though not as a method for assimilation, but punishment, blaming her own daughter for causing her father's death, the alcohol consumption, the falling down, the crashing of his skull on border boulders, in my imagined memory, I see my mother kicking and screaming, fighting her way away from the asylum doors. I remember there is no God for us. A winter night, my brother and I kept awake with long overdue conversations and ignored memory of our eldest sister driving past the now torn down hospital, unknowing why our mother was there. Only the words our father shared that our mother was once left behind. I realize why our mother's eyes turn to melting mercury every time I suggest therapy. It was the 1970s. Her brown skin, her high cheekbones, her propensity to be easily knocked over, a newborn fawn struggling to walk for the first time. I can only imagine her being an easy target, her mother driving the family car straight toward her, headlights bright as the sun. Her mother held the crossbow, the institution held the gravestones. Thank you. Um, yeah, I should give a trigger warning or a content warning for most of my work, I should say. Um, is it okay to use profanity here? Okay, <laughs> just wanna make sure. Um, this just has one profane word in it, and this poem is called Grief Vulture. True story. He was the first man I dared to date after nearly a decade of embracing my aloneness. His, his losing two brothers to alcoholism in a year, my losing a sister to illness, a father to lack of self-care, I dared to connect with him through grief. You fucking grief vulture, he crooned in rage, that I had the audacity to think our grief was similar. Lady grief has laid many bodies before me. Time after time I dropped to my knees pecking for left behind remnants to remember the unforgotten taste of my loved ones. Today I, fucking grief vulture, wear a long soft sweater as the spring day cold and white beckons for flight to the next funeral with my arrogant sprawl of wings. My gentle touch was so tender against his skin, his fury laughable, an afterthought while I feasted on the bones of devastation the black marbles of my eyes dilate. I revolt, I hunger, I persist. Thank you. <laughs> um, speaking of grief, a lot of, my, a lot of my poems are about grief. Um, I lost a sister six years ago and I lost another one just a few weeks ago. So I'm gonna try to get through this poem. Um, and it's based out of um, UCSF, Parnassus. Real flowers are not allowed in ICU. After 15 hours in and out of a hospital room, heart monitors sound like church bells and I can no longer find myself. Alarms resound as the heart rate reaches above 140 at rest. Fluorescent yellow alerts on the screen, ticking and flashing and yelling heart rate high. Oxygen levels scream blue. Respiration rate breathes white. Blood, cr blood pressure cuffs buzz and rerun on automated schedules. Overworked staff scan barcodes on wrists as if patients are imported produce in lonely grocery aisles. Fentanyl whispers into ivy lines. Blood draws again, whistling red into plastic tubing. Waiting and waiting, waiting and waiting as sounds mold together. There's a man screaming in the next room. He sounds like a small bear raging. From the 13th floor of this hospital, you can make out the Pacific in the distance. Look down and there are people walking the park path, casually enjoying the sun. A thousand topics in an apple blossom. The generous earth itself gave us life. Your life is draining here. 
and the deluge of noise has become a part of me. I am tired. Your pulse slowly ceases. The color was the first to go. Your fresh flowers are still in the waiting room. Thank you. Um, I have three more poems. Uh, recently, we were at, Brenda was with me at the Sierra Poetry Festival in Grass Valley. I had the opportunity to read and um, teach a class. And my class was on creating the private poem, basically things that we intentionally don't want to write about or share with the public. So we were writing private poems to ourselves. And I questioned people to write down a list of things they wanted to avoid writing about. And with my practice of writing, I typically write about anything that makes me uncomfortable. It's my own practice of healing. Um, but I did realize that I can't write about war. It's really hard for me to write about what's going on in Gaza, about any war. Um, so I kind of challenged myself, and I, I came up with these two poems. Forward Folding. To release some of the pent-up tension in my spine from one long day in an office chair and 400 years of sorrow, I lean my body forward, swan dive into a fold, touching hands to toes as the dark stone-colored mastiff creeps her way between my arms and legs, lets me curl my body over hers, catching my weight with her tall, guard-like stature. I am so tired, too tired to love, but she insists, demands even, that I not be too tired to love her. Her kind once stood beside Roman soldiers in times of war, now she stands beside a common woman, tattered and torn over such things that will never be deemed war-stricken. Sometimes I think she can sense each memory of abandon, hers and mine. Sometimes I can't help but think how her kind in Palestine are protecting their humans, their hurt bodies curled around rubble, seeking the next day. Some bodies hurled forward from the impact of explosion, some over the suffering of chronic pain, as we try to discern which is worse, as if there is a measure of suffering that can tell us the right way to hurt. Thank you. Practicing poetry in a dance studio. Sitting in a room with lavender walls, my sanctuary on this day, our day of words, but yesterday, driving along Highway 12 with my best friend to the Valley of Grass, a storm brewing on the horizon, we talk about layers of blue in the sky and war crimes, how colonialism affected my people all those years ago, how it is affecting the other side of the world now, how bodies are exploded upon in times of genocide, how desecrating the holy shapes an entire people impacts the earth's surface when their anatomies are forced into the ground, lacerated and bent and broken. How bodies once sacred burn to ash, how we torture in the name of peace, how we kill in the name of God. Sitting in a room with lavender walls, I ask myself, which war is mine to carry? Thank you. Um, so all of that is heavy. <laughs> I will admit it's very heavy. So I'm going to end with a love poem, um, which is slightly embarrassing because I don't write love poems. <laughs> um, by the second date in Sacramento. We watched bay seals bark at passersby below the waterfront sunset. I tasted honey lavender saltwater taffy from the old town candy shop. Let it melt on my tongue after you left me for the night. Let it stick to the roof of my mouth, molding the taste into attributes I'd never want to forget. The madrona of your hands, licorice root of your eyes, the sound of your sigh I wanted to embed below the surface of my flesh. A shared intellect over guava tea on a sun-drenched day, a walk to Capitol Park orange trees, 32 hours suspended in time, a segment of peacemaking. My love, you say, and I want to hide behind the park's Guadalupe cypress trees to keep this newfound shade of blush to myself for just a bit longer. Come find me behind the northern Catalpa. Place us under the southern magnolia. Reach for my hand below the California buckeye. 
Drive me through Oak Park with your hand on my thigh. Backtrack to Midtown Star Jasmine growing over city fences. Find my scent in the same air as the sidewalk lilac I leaned over to inhale. Already missing the tenderness of your love drunk hands on the small of my back, how you coax the wisteria out of me. I, the hibiscus in your arms. It's 2 a.m. and I love you already. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Those were hard, but you know, sometimes they need to be. So there's that. <laughs> Sorry, I just noticed somebody else I love in the audience. Um, <laughs> um, so our, our next reader is Kimi Sugioka. And um, I keep forgetting how we met, although I'm sure it was through poetry, but um, you know. It feels like it was 30 years ago, and I feel like it probably wasn't, but um, but it still feels that way, so I'm going to leave that alone. <laughs> People mistake us for one another because it's KS. We're both KS. And, uh, um, and I think it's really funny because <laughs> I've been credited with Wild and Wing a number of times, and I do not. I don't mind. <laughs> I'm not mad about that. <laughs> um, what? <laughs> it's like, uh, okay. Um, yeah, it's funny. But um, I don't know. Uh, we've had some grand adventures together, and I expect more to come. Please welcome to this microphone, Kimi Sugioka. <laughs> Yeah, I want to I want to face the people. <laughs> um thank you. Thank you library. Thank you people. Thank you Kim. Appreciate it. My first poem is called My Griffin Selves. Griffin is a, a a mythical creature. It's part feline and has wings. I was a groundling thing padding on velvet noiseless paws, walking around the edges of rooms close to the walls, running and hiding at loud noises, fast movements or harsh words. And then, ever so slowly, painfully as newly budding breasts, the tips started pushing like thorns through my shoulder blades, gradually lengthening, widening, spreading, we became dusty and winged, clawed and feathered, until we could both run and fly for fear or joy, the predator and prey in one conundrum. Waking, reeling, gorging on clouds or four-footed prey, we try not to make mistake ourselves for a meal or a monster. We are often at odds with ourselves and the world. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I've been in some tropical places lately. So I thought I'd read this. The, uh, uh, yeah, with Susan. I was <laughs> in this friend, Costa Rica. The monkeys are getting closer. A blackbird flaunts an elegant sheen of blue-black back feathers, casts one brilliant yellow eye my way, as if to say, don't outstay your welcome. A squadron of pelicans show their silvered wings while performing intricate sky dances. The sky hall shimmers with unanswerable questions. Leave your corpse by the wayside and wander inside your life unencumbered. The monkeys are howling in some ritual retelling of their stories, their histories, their love of wandering. Some dream before they sleep in enlightened journeys beyond the pale shadows of morning 
and the deep shadows of night. I worked really hard not to pick all sad poems. I just want you to know. <laughs> um, so I'm going to read the sad poem now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, flashlight. I watch the sun setting on San Francisco windows and steel flame brightly and importantly, but when the light shines on one side of a wall, it is easy to forget that the other side still exists. When I am thirsty, I turn on the tap. When I am hungry, I go to the store and choose among ridiculous numbers of brands and flavors I don't have to wait four to six hours for a piece of bread. When I am tired, I lie down on, bed, on a bed with blankets. I don't have to find a tent or piece of cardboard. I don't have to sleep on concrete or sand. Which war is more important? The one on driven and desperate migrants at the border, the one in Palestine, Ukraine, Lebanon, Iran, Yemen, Syria, the one on the unhoused on US city streets. During the march and rally, I walk past filthy and destitute people lying on the street. I wonder what we look like through their eyes. 10,000 march to defend a country 7,000 miles away. We don't march for them. We live in a darkness illumined by media, religious and monocultural flashlights that shine here and there, illuminating one, illuminating one thing and leaving the rest in darkness. Flash, 1,400 dead in Hamas attack on Israel. Flash, 35,000 dead in Israeli attack on Palestine. Flash, flash, flash. Which is more valuable, a gull or a turn, a door or a dog or a cat, a brown bear or a black bear, a Palestinian life or an Israeli life, a Ukrainian life or a Russian life, a homeless person or a person making a living wage. I don't want to hear another mother or father describe the murder of their child, children, nieces, nephews, 36 members of a family, 14,000 children. I don't want to speak of false justifications for bombing Palestinians trapped like fish in a 225 square mile bucket. I don't want to see hundreds of wailing mothers and sobbing fathers digging through rubble to recover the bodies of their children and relatives, but to cover my eyes and ears is to feign ignorance and to be silenced is complicit. I've stopped writing about the wars because I don't know what the words are anymore. So that was the last one. Okay, something a little lighter. <sighs> Presence. Seems like all poems are about death. We cannot contain presence or secret it in our back pockets like a flask of whiskey? No, the words rampage across the page with muddy feet on a white tiled kitchen floor, constantly stumbling forward like a drunk in an alley, crashing into dumpsters of metaphors again and again. Every step, an encounter with the mirror or the grave. Why doesn't it ring like church bells in our skulls and remind us not to flee, but to encompass this one gilded moment? Thank you. Okay, I think I'm going to read two more short ones. Ah, the sky people. I want to read about the sky people. Downwind of eternity, a slice of orange sunlight heralds legions of sky people. Fumbling with the lock of daylight that splinters into noon, spouting sermons so drunk with love, all souls sigh in unison. 
clouds thunder open in a palmed caress, in a fist of wind, in the clutch of winter, in the cinch of summer. The star's teeth shine with deception in this weft of time, woof of moans. Where do they go with their flailing wings aflame with laughter? OK. I have to read this little poem, archived on tape for Kim Chuck. Salted kisses stagger the rhythm of ragged fortune. Here we sit in all our separations, whispering small dreams through chasms like wolves, howling across mountains, resonating connections that beckon the poets to expose the lies based on the premise of our own demise, all the while surreptitiously humming serenity songs. Thank you. How do you follow a poem to you? I don't know that I know. I very specifically, currently what I'm working on is a series of poems. I'm gonna think, I'm gonna do as many of them as I can. Um, I, I do these things where I write about one thing until my spotters tell me it is time to stop doing that. <laughs> um, my spotters being family, Doug and my kids and Right now what I'm writing about is I'm writing eyes for the women of Iran. And it was just so sad when I was looking at them right before coming over. I thought, yeah, let's not do that. It's a little too hard still, and I, yeah, I'm a week into it, you know? Um, and I have no idea, but I thought I'd read some uh, poems from Find May and A Book of Matches, which was a series that I did last year. And I have no idea how depressing these are, so again, engage your core. <laughs> Where flames of protection is the sky shift, world shift, and don't we need sanctuary in the years-long ceremony of politician-led harassment? The burning times again. A woman is uterus, a woman is uterus. Here in May, we reclaim the bone fire, the protection, the ceremony. Word mentioned by someone else, a nice shape, a good round sound, a bundle of thought seeds, a collection of experiences slipped into your mouth, under your tongue. Unsaid, it's almost a cure for itself, almost a handful, almost medicine. I lurk in affectation until it is released and unfolds. Sky has her own business agenda, runs no matter the snarl on the central freeway, the variations of the news chanting about the horrors of this city, finches their brown and white lightning, the afternoon, their heads like flowers. Bedding down while the city star bathes, yes, the changes we mourn them, and yes, a city will city, and the conspiracy to commit commerce proceeds. Window shops for politicians, for each room and the portable one, for these car dash and still these hills are cradled in starlight. What history will you use as kindling? It won't be the version that makes you feel a hero who knows where the fires of May come from. Red feathers on the finch's head, red feathers, the flowers that look like sparklers, coal bright on the hillside, a flash of hawk's shoulder, the leap of the red-legged frog. First night, the ache of a flower moon, a moon eclipse, a tumble of flowers. We counted them before we put them under our pillow. Hear the singing of lilac, jasmine, orange, may, roses. Most of the fruit has set, but the moon is rising, armed for this dangerous season, armed with songs and flowers. Loud moon singing dark rainbows, blurring the planets and crawling in the window to catch human geometry of hip and snore and shoulder. Unrelated nouns, discreet, each and certain. A night puzzle, a crater. 
She sets with a sigh our warrior in flowers, our moon. The news, the news isn't a hot cup of tea and hasn't been for years. We brew new words in an eggshell, in a fallen nest. We brew new words in this time and place from petals and compost. Spider weaves an old basket, an old basket, and fills it with mud to catch the sun. We tumble outwards, listening towards a story in spirals that can translate these cities, these coded streets, emerging in other poems and change. Maria wears a dress crocheted from poems, and scaling this part of May, that dress is good protection, linked flower shapes, a lace of grandmother's scrap yarn and adjectives in complicated discount store color schemes. The mixed fibers that we know here past the palisades in spite of the rumors, there are rules just not the ones you know. Empty day just means that here we do everything else. Myth mattering as it does, mumbling in the empty safe we keep in the kitchen. Myth takes work. We lean hard into healing and make stories, make heroes, make lunch, make spackle to fill the holes in our walls, our guardian spaces. Left-handed poems read like salad into an awkward microphone. Those frustrated assertions of existence stacked against assurances of no building from first principles. Self-written in skin on sacred days recently chosen, leaning in. Morning, friction of thought bubble and caffeine. Delivery throws a spark, lights the rebar of imagination. Something has to hold up these Fridays. It's a big ask. A poem as load-bearing wall, another finch, another nightmare, another song over the kitchen table. Cars, wine like thread, like least obvious solutions, the pulled stitch, the clot, the gasp. They are carrying signs. They are signs. And here the word love might mean fear. It might be an offering on a misunderstood altar. You don't have to bring your own manifesto. The library, almost mermaid, is reading somewhere in the building. A remote dialogue of signs and portents. The flock is startled off of the roof ridge. The mermaid in this case is a being from the edges. She is reading, tucked in an imaginary house all day. The yellow and pink scales, the handset floorboards, a place to stand, a place to lean into. Just one of these hills hisses and crawls with the residue of a war that never started and won't end until it does. They're just walls. The hours, the numbers, the covers, grandma behind walls. If unraveled, what patterns, what safety, what organelles, what borrowed systems of energy. Sometimes the layered ideas almost make a pattern. Thank you so very much. I wanted to share uh, just on the subject of love poems. Um, when I was about 18, I was in Ireland briefly and a guy in a bar who was trying to pick me up because I was 18, and he was not. In that incredible way that some Irish men have, <laughs> I had read some poems, and he looked at me and he said, well, you only write love poems. And even though I know it was a line, I think maybe all poems are love poems on some level. <laughs> so I'm going to break a rule, because I can, and I'm going to ask Charlie to come up here and give us a poem, because he's here. And I know that I can usually get away with that. <laughs> Charlie Getter, who is not yet an official laureate, but as far as I'm concerned. Not happen, baby. Hi, my name is Charlie. Oh, we're going to do this one instead. Because it's about poetry, right? The world is full of landlocked places, places where the ocean can't get to, the ocean with its power and its waves and its dominance, dominance across the wide face of this world, hundreds of thousands of miles of pure power, splitting the world from itself with its grandeur and its arrogance. Landlocked places don't see that ocean that tells them we ain't so bad. And the world is full of landlocked places and landlocked places are hell. I've been to Switzerland, and Switzerland is landlocked, and Switzerland is hell. I've never been to Bolivia, but Bolivia's a landlocked place, so Bolivia must be hell. The first tweakers came to Bolivia. 
and they chewed leaves, and they stayed up all night, and their tents were really clean. But they didn't care because they knew they lived in a landlocked place, and it's the same with all landlocked places. It was hell, and I could see so far over an ocean. My heart can be its own seagull, sailing on the wings of the ocean's power, sailing off to different shores where they make funny-looking buildings and really good Chinese food. But my heart turns into a snail or a three-toed sloth when it tries to see into a heart in a landlocked place because landlocked places are hell. Kansas was never the answer to anything. <laughs> Not even for Dorothy. It's black and it's white and there's no cowardly line to protect you. Switzerland is not my kind of an answer. Written across the sky by a smoky plane. For one thing, it's almost impossible to spell. And a spell is what I'm under. And this feeling hasn't happened to me for a very long time. Because poetry is an affliction. And if it isn't, then you shouldn't do it. And the afflicted gather in every corner of the world. And those who got it bad, those who got it real bad, they know who they are. We know who we are. We know each other. And we need each other. And I'm just a rambling fool who knows where the land ends and the ocean begins. And it sure as hell don't in Kansas because landlocked places are hell. And I can see the sky clear as I pull my Geo Metro away from the coast and through the mountains and through the deserts to over more mountains to where the flat land rushes to meet the overarching sky and the wind blows and it sometimes drops houses on witches and it sometimes holds mysteries that a couple of meaningless hours within a few worthless days did far too little to illuminate because Kansas isn't the answer. Neither is any where. It's a different interrogative. And San Francisco can slowly sink below the horizon. And I will only watch as the waves play on the sand and my dog chases birds. Thanks, you guys. You guys are awesome. Yeah, you can write together. I don't remember where. This is so often. I guess so. Yeah, you and I are on the same deal as that. Yeah. Yeah. You probably have to sign a piece of paper now because I made you read. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much to the library. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Kenny. Uh, thank you, everybody who came to be audience because audience makes this better. And thank you, everybody who's going to watch this as audience online because that still counts. And there are some of my favorite places in this little room in this basement. And uh, have a great month. Come back next time.